welcome to our webinar today. Uh, the webinar, just to make sure on the right one, is uh, Best Practices for the Modern Operations Center. And uh, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about seven best practices that will enhance the performance of, uh, of our staff and the operations center for mission critical operations in environments and workplaces. <clears throat> and today, we, we have us uh, being joined by uh, SBFI. They're a, a console furniture manufacturer that works in the mission critical space. And as we go through the webinar, I'll make some introductions and I'll allow them some time here to uh, talk a little bit about their organization and, and what they provide. But uh, again, thank you for joining us. And uh, this will be recorded, so if you'd like to get a copy of it, we can certainly get that out to you. Uh, we're going to hold off on questions until we get towards the end of our uh, of our webinar today, so we can keep the flow going. We we try to to do these webinars in in, in a 35 to 45 minute window, uh, out of respect for your time. I know that a lot of people don't have an hour or hour and a half to sit in on a webinar, so we try to be very informative. We move fairly quickly through things, and uh, so we hop around just a little bit, but uh, we'll try to stay focused as we can on our agenda today, which are the, the seven practices, um, you know, best practices for control rooms. And so, you know, kind of with that um, being said, let me do this. Let me um, just take 30 seconds to introduce you to the, who Diversified is. I, I see the list and there are many of you that have attended our webinars before. So this is probably, uh, um, you know, old news to you about who we are. But for those of this is your first time on our webinars, I'd like to just let you know that Diversified is a 23-year-old um, uh, organization based out of uh, Kenilworth, New Jersey. We, we, we actually um, have a very, very strong background in what we would define as visual and collaboration um, systems integration. And so what does that really mean? It, it means that we work with a variety of different types of customers uh, from uh, corporate to broadcast to media and entertainment. Uh, we work in some levels of the medical field uh, and in the mission critical field. And when I say we work in those areas, what we do is we provide visualization technologies. And if you see the slide in front of you here, this is a very good representation of the mission critical side of, of our business and what we're here to talk about today. But we do a lot of visualization for you know, corporate audio, visual, and meeting rooms, training rooms. Uh, we do a lot with the uh, broadcast arena, like I said, as well as uh, media and entertainment. Um, we are a global company. We have about 40 plus offices now um, around the world, and many of those are in the United States, but we do have a, a fairly strong presence growing over in uh, EMEA in the European market as well and, and in Asia. And so that's a little bit about diversified. And, you know, again, uh, today, this particular uh, webinar is being hosted by the mission critical group for diversified called um, uh, Mission Critical Environments, MCE, we, we go by. But also, we're, we're being joined by um, a couple of people from SBFI. And I'm going to turn this over to, to Jennifer and Brandon for them to do a quick introduction of their company. And, uh, and then once we do that, we'll, uh, we'll kick this thing off and get going into the seven best practices. So Jennifer, you want to, whoops, going a little bit too fast there, but uh, Jennifer, you want to talk just real quick about uh, SBFI? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Robert. Um, for those of you that have not um, heard of SBFI, uh, we are, as Robert said, a console uh, manufacturer. We manufacture for mission critical and we also have a financial division as well. We are a global company, just like Diversified. Um, we've installed consoles in 55 different countries. We were established in 1976 um, and have a wide range of experience with design, installation, and manufacturing. But as Robert said, Brandon and I join you today from the Mission Critical Division, and we are really really excited to be here. We cover the United States, and out of the United States, our manufacturing facility is actually based in Asheville, North Carolina. So we really appreciate you joining us and look forward to the entire presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And, uh, you know, one of the things I do want to 
stresses while we do work all over the world, all over the country. Uh, we do a lot of work in the Southeast, and I know that there are a lot of uh, participants today that um, are customers that are in the Southeast. And so I, I wanted to show this particular uh, graphic so you can see where we have offices and support uh, around the Southeast and where um, projects are that we've done. And, and this is just a partial list of, of the projects, but as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, um, we, we do have a very strong customer base in the Southeast, and um, you know we're very proud of the work that we've done for for these customers. And those customers include um, you know utility control rooms to 911 centers, emergency operations centers, um, some university security operations, traffic management centers, and, and the list goes on. Anything with a, a mission critical um, um, charter to to their mission statement, and so. Uh, let's let's just dive right in here to uh, what we're we're here to talk about, and you know. So let let me say this as we get started. To when when we show seven, you know, best practices. This isn't all of them, right? This is just about a short list, if you will, of what we can get into a a quick 35, 45 minute uh, webinar. And and I, I said this a minute ago. We try to move fairly quickly and just provide tips and techniques and ideas and recommendations. Um, this is not a deep dive into any one of these particular best practices because we could talk for probably 20, 30 minutes on many of these just by themselves. And so what you'll see in today is just, it, it, it's really a, a great introduction to, to best practices if you're either renovating your existing facility or building a new building where you're going to have a mission critical environment, um, or if you're upgrading your console furniture or your video wall or doing anything to that uh, th that mission critical room or facility, these are just going to be really nice ideas and and great uh, tips for you to take back to your planning, uh, so that you can incorporate these into the work that you do. Um, a, a lot of what we're going to do today is I'm going to hop around a little bit, but uh, at the end of the day, everything that you see in front of you in terms of these best practices that they all work hand in hand together in tandem um, as, as what I would call a holistic e ecosystem, if you will, because, you know, as you'll see when we start talking about each of these, you, you'll realize that, you know, sight lines um, is influenced by console. Consoles are influenced by sight lines and the operating picture and the placement of this stuff. The lighting impacts where things are and how things look and how the rooms planned out. So all of this stuff is, it's like a, like I said, like an ecosystem. And, and so it all, all works together and needs to be orchestrated that way when you're planning for um, upgrading, updating your, your control room. So um, th the last thing I want to point out about what we're going to talk about today is there is a lot of science behind what we do in the mission critical world. And the science is what we define as ergonomics and human factor issues and, and how those two things are blended today with operational um, characteristics of a room as well as the technology that supports the operations in that room. So, you know, we'll, we'll explain a bit more about the human factor issues and ergonomics as we go through these. Uh, with that said, let's just dive into collaboration. So uh, this is a conversation, by the way. The, the way that we conduct our webinars is not a presentation where we're just going to, you know, have me talking for 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to, between Jennifer and Brandon and myself, uh, we'll be, you know, talking a little bit together and, and in, in, on each of these slides. And so, you know, with collaboration, for example, uh, you know, Jennifer and Brandon may want to add to that and, and feel free to do so, guys. But uh, so collaboration really, you know, in the mission critical world means a lot of things to uh, different people. And, you know, for me, what I have found in talking to my customers is that, you know, there are a lot of different types of platforms out there that are used for collaboration. And a lot of my customers use multiple different platforms to do their work. And so, you know, you might be using just email, you know, for for one thing, and then you're you're on your phone texting, and then you're you know doing a if you're working abroad, you might do a, a WhatsApp if you you have uh, you know offices overseas to a whole host of different types of of collaboration platforms. You could be using video conferencing, 
you know, you know, different things out there that they're available. And what I have found is that customers that minimize the use of a broad selection of these co collaborative tools seem to be happier with their, you know, their operational w workflow and how, how they, they perform work together. Because, you know, it is very difficult to be hopping around from different platforms all the, all the time. So for me, I like to stress with my customers that, you know, anything you can do to streamline the complexity of what it takes for somebody to do their job is always going to uh, enhance the way that they work and, and make them uh, more productive. Ease of use of these things as well. So some of the platforms out there that are uh, available for collaboration are very complex and, and can be, you know, unless you're a power user, something that's a little intimidating sometimes with all the different features. You know, I mean, just a lot of times you look at the WebExes and the, you know, Skypes of the world, they're pretty easy to, to, to do. But, you know, if you really want to get into some, you know, advanced features, I mean, they have a lot of advanced features that um, can be a little intimidating sometimes to uh, to learn how to use. So from a collaborative standpoint, like I said, I, I think the takeaway is uh, to, to minimize the number of different platforms people use in the mission critical environment so that they can focus on their job rather than having to worry about, you know, which platform to use for what. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, you know, Jennifer, Brandon, your experience being the same or, or have you had different experiences when it comes to working with your customers? Because the reason I'm asking you guys this is, you know, so collaboration isn't just about technology. It's about floor planning and how do you position people within a, a mission critical facility, especially if it's a larger facility. Because the larger the facility, more people in there, um, you may split people up into work groups, for example, when you lay out the consoles where, you know, there might be three or four people that work on a certain type of uh, problem or a certain type of uh, solution that's being monitored or provided. Is, is that been your experience? Um, yeah, this is Jennifer, and yes, absolutely. And uh, going on to your point about the different platforms, we also see that as well, that just the different data sources coming in because from the console's point of view, we have to figure out how they integrate into the furniture and also looking at it um, from the side of, yes, how are how is the communication between you know operators and managers and groups? So this is something that should really be discussed and thought about up front so that we can ensure from a console perspective that not only do we lay out the floor correctly, but we choose the right design to integrate these, these platforms and making sure everyone's communicating um, as best in the way that they would like to. Brandon, yeah. is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, kind of bouncing off of that point, one of the things that I've noticed about collaboration, too, is really the the interaction between operators and managers within a room. That's not really something that you think about when you're going for features of a console or software you're going to put on a video wall. If you do have an active project, there's a million things in your mind that you're considering. But later on in projects, once things have settled down and people have actually gotten to the usability of their room, they run into issues of, well, you know, we have monitors blocking operators that can't talk to each other, or we have a manager that doesn't have a direct sight line of a training console, so they can't really help out a lot of their operators in that capacity. It's just not only the way software and technology and, you know, equipment like furniture is going to integrate and collaborate, considering how the operators and managers are going to work together with each other and the equipment afterwards is definitely a consideration to do uh, beforehand. Saves a lot of time and effort from having to go back and rethink a problem after you've already gotten an entire room set up. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that, you know, for me, that last thing that you said was uh, really key to a lot of uh, solving a lot of problems when you're designing rooms like this and, and renovating and, and, and restructuring how you'd, you'd you uh, set your control room up. And that is that um, there's a lot of planning that needs to take place, a lot of thought and, and hard thinking, asking some tough questions up front about, you know, w w what is it you envision for this room at the end of the day? How does it need to work? How do people work together? 
you know, um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not a uh, minimalistic part of, of the control room. Collaboration can be a variety of different things. So uh, those are all good points um, for that. Um, you, you know, I want to keep going here because you had mentioned sight lines of a supervisor, for example. Um, you know, sight lines can be a variety of different things. So when I think of sight lines, Brandon, I think of, um, you know, the horizontal and vertical uh, viewing angles of a operator or a dispatcher sitting at the console and having access to looking over the entire room uh, without a, an obstruction blocking their view. And then if there is a video wall in that room and they need access to viewing that, what is the sight lines um, and the viewing angles of that operator's ability to see that entire video wall and the content on that video wall? Because so often I, you know, so there, there's a second part of, or third bullet on this slide that says the oh no moment. I frequently, <laughs> work with architects and construction companies, even end user customers, you know, this isn't their full-time job and I don't expect them to know this. They, they, that's why they hire us to work with them is to be able to think through some of the nuances that might not be obvious. And one of the things is when you select your consoles and decide on the monitors that you're going to have at the desktop and, and how they're going to be placed, what size they are, et cetera, you know, taking into account the ceiling height in that room and the video wall to make sure that the operator can see over the top of the monitors at their desktop and still see the bottom of the video wall. And it is amazing to me when I come into some projects a little late in the game, how that's been missed. And again, I, you know, we do this for a living, right? So we don't, shouldn't expect our customers and, and even some of the architects we work with to know this um, but it is really important that, that sight lines and, you know, your viewing angles are, are all considered. And, and again, to your point about collaboration, it's not just about viewing the video wall. It's about how do you operate in that room if it's a larger room, especially smaller rooms of two or three or four people. It's not such a big deal. But if you get 15, 20 people in a room or more, and we've done control rooms where there have literally been four or five dozen people in a room, uh, it becomes very important. Um, do, do you, you, would you agree with that? Uh, this is Jennifer. Absolutely. I think, um, as Brandon said, and you said, understanding, first of all, how the room is going to work, how the individuals within the room are going to work, um, is the very first step when setting it up. And when you're talking about those screens and sight lines, um, I do deal with this on a regular basis, almost on a daily basis, because um, not only are video walls um, going up everywhere, the monitors, the size of monitors on the consoles are just getting larger and larger. So unless the console can, um, you know, handle these, these monitors all in an individual row, then there may be that problem with the video walls. So that is something that really does need to be analyzed up front. And what are the different options? Because you have to consider the real estate as well. If your monitors on the console are getting larger, then your console may be getting larger. So it is something that really should be thought of up front. And I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah, it's, it's an important part of laying out and designing um, control rooms. But like I said, I don't... I don't expect our, all the architects we work with or the contractors that are building these rooms or doing renovations or even the customer. You know, a customer builds a control room on average, you know, maybe once every seven or eight years, and some even 10, and they might refresh the technology in there and the consoles maybe every eight to 10 years. Um, so this is not something that, you know, it, it's sort of like, I guess, if you live in a home for, and I, oh, I'm going to use this as a reference because I just went through this, but I lived in my previous house for 20 years and, and then decided to move. And, uh, you know, I'd totally forgotten uh, what all was involved in, in buying and selling a house and moving and all that. And I'm, I kind of underestimated many of the things that were required. And I don't expect customers to be experts at control rooms when you do it once every eight to 10 years, right? It's not something that's uh, that's a daily thing for them. 
So, uh, so anyway, and that's the purpose of what we're doing today is hopefully shed some light on some of the highlights of, um, of best practices in the room. So sight lines, again, kind of circling back here, very important uh, to the process. And uh, so it, this to me, performance seating is one of the, uh, the hidden gems, if you will, of how you can increase productivity um, from your, your staff. And, and this is where the human factor issues come in. In the control rooms that I've been involved in, there are a lot of customers that just don't have the budget to go spend, uh, I don't know, anywhere from several hundred dollars, maybe 900 or 1,000 up to, they can get on up into the $2,000 range for a very nice, high performance, seven by 24 rated, you know, uh, seat and or chair as they as we most of us call it but th this this is real important because the way that these chairs are designed today for the mission critical work environment that again that are 24 7 rated are made very very specific to some science behind it there are some real engineering that goes in and this this graphic that's on this slide uh, shows a lot of that in terms of the materials that are used to the way that something is designed and shaped to the different types of settings and adjustments that you have in the in the chair that you purchase the back supports um, you know it it is unbelievable the difference that a really good chair that is properly designed uh, can have on that dispatcher or the operator at the console because they have done scientific studies that show that you know the proper seating in that room in the mission critical room um, can reduce stress and by reducing stress it increases alertness and awareness it in reducing stress uh, reduces headaches back aches you know other physical problems that uh, arise out of not having the proper type of uh, tool for somebody. And, and you have to look at the seat, right? The chair is, is a tool that they use um, in, in their job. And have you guys found that out too? I know that you probably work with it a lot as well because you're you know, right there with the customer within the consoles. But you know, that's been my experience. Yeah, Robert, this is Brandon. Um, it's kind of an interesting fact that I've learned being in the control room industry for a number of years, but some of the most consistent feedback I get from directors, especially in emergency management, is that it's a contributing factor to employee retention. Um, not saying that if someone has a comfortable chair, they're going to, I mean, and not a comfortable chair, they're just going to quit, but this level of stress that these people deal with in answering 911 calls, or if you're in an, uh, like an electric utility dispatch center where you literally have people's lives on the line, linemen hanging electric cabling, if it just adds to their stress if they're not in some comfortable chair, especially for those long rides of 8 to 12 hours, Someone that's coming to work day after day, year after year, that's just uncomfortable and stressed out because they don't have proper equipment like this, little things that add to their mentality, it's, it's something that directors have seen as a, I'd say, a direct result of, sorry about that, a direct result of uh, employee retention. So, yeah, it's very important to consider. Yeah, I, I'm... I, I tell you, I um, I can just attest to it firsthand. You know, by you know, just not in the mission critical workspace, just in my office, not having a very good chair really impacts my ability to to stay focused on you know doing my job every day. So I can't imagine you know somebody that's got longer shifts than maybe I do. Or, uh, or needing to focus more on some very important things, uh, how it would impact those guys. Um, and anything that you can do, you, you know, I mean, so we talked earlier about the science behind all this, and there really is, I mean, not just in the seating and the chairs, but, but in the lighting, and we're going to get to lighting here in, in a few minutes, but the way a console is designed, and we're going to get to that coming up next, but all of these things, whether it's the console design, 
uh, whether it's the lighting in the room, how the room's laid out, sight lines, all of these things um, have an impact on, on human factors. And, and those human factors, to me, if I'm you know, a, a, an operations manager, in charge of, you know, uh, in your what you described a minute ago as an electric utility control room. So, you know, for me, it would be about how do I make my people more productive? And to do that, I've got to make them more comfortable uh, so that they can be more aware, alert, have less stress on them. And, uh, and then, you know, that does over the long period of time, that, that will help retention of employees as well. It's not going to be the only thing. Yeah, people don't stay at a job just because they have comfortable chairs, right? <laughs> Although, um, you know, uh, it'd be kind of interesting to know what the statistics are as to what it is that, you know, um, causes employees to stay at a particular job, a high-stress job longer than others. But, uh, but seating is real important, and uh, so I ramble on about seating. So, you know, kind of coming up next as we tie in the human factor issues with uh, uh, productivity and and the, the human performance of your employees is, is the console, right? And so this is your area of expertise. And so with console furniture, let me say this, um, you know, I've been doing this now for, gosh, you know, the mission critical side, maybe as much as 15 or 16 years, a little bit longer. But um, there, there are a lot of providers in the marketplace out there. There are a lot of options for customers to look at. And uh, you know, honestly, out of several that I've done business with over the many years I've been doing this, I, I've not run across anybody that doesn't provide a really nice product, well built, and and that doesn't run a good company. There are a lot of there's a lot of competition out there. However, I say that um, to you know not brag on you guys so much, but I know that in the time we've worked together, I have found you to be very responsive and that you guys um, have been creative in helping solve some problems and challenges for some of the customers that you've worked with, uh, with some of our other people. So I kind of look at consoles as, you know, looking beyond just the design of the furniture. Uh, while there are some very unique things that you guys have uh, in your design, the way you manufacture, the materials you use, which you'll speak to, but I also find that it's, it's, it's as much about, and, and even in what I do, right? So this is, maybe a best practice of, of what we do in helping our customers. And that is, you know, it's not that you're not going to ever have problems on a project. It's how you handle those pro problems, right? And the outcome that you have at the end of the day. And uh, because I don't think I've ever worked on a project that, that hasn't had some sort of little, you know, problem or issue, but, but we, I got through it. We got through it together with the customers and everybody was happy. Um, so my point in saying that, it, you know, talking about console furniture or video walls for that matter, it, it, there's more to it than just the products themselves. It's really who you're working with, um, you know, as a provider of this stuff. So kind of with that, you know, why don't you take us through a little bit about what, what, what is it that makes, makes a good console solution for a customer? And I know customers have different needs. A 911 may have a different requirement than a security ops center, than a, a control room in a, a utility or a traffic management center. There, there are a lot of similarities, but there has to be some uniquenesses that, um, that allow you to differentiate your product from other products in the market. So take us through that. You know, I've got on my slide here, materials, design, performance, et cetera. I may use those as kind of uh, bullets to, to talk through. Thank you, Robert, and uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed working with Diversified as well, and uh, really appreciate the value you, that you guys bring to our projects and how we work together. But as Robert said, um, there, there are a lot of console manufacturers out there, um, and it, it, if it's a good one, then you know we will have a lot of the same features. Um, now in the command and control room environment, Sit, sit stand or electric height adjustable as we call it, cable management, heat management, all those things are the norm. It's a given. It should be there. Um, in regards to SBFI, one thing that I think is really unique um, is our entire project management um, and research and development and engineers are housed again in Asheville, North Carolina. 
And the owner of SBFI actually um, owns several different companies that are all vertically integrated into um, SBFI, the heat treating, the metal finishing, the wood facility. And what that allows us to do is customize. So you don't open a catalog and find different types of consoles. We literally meet with the customer, depending on the type of control room it is, and we can customize the solution based on equipment, collaboration, sight lines, all, all the things that we've discussed up to this point. And we can do it very easily because we have control of that vertical integration within the console. Um, I find that, of course, durability, um, materials, all those things go into what makes a good console. But as Robert mentioned, I think it also has a lot to do with, you know, the project management, the quality, what happens if there is a problem, how do you handle it? And I feel like SBFI, I've been with SBFI for 10 years now, and I can um, say that I feel really good about all those things, having been with this company for that long. Um, Brandon, from your point of view, do you have anything to add? What do you think in regards to SBFI and the console that you've seen this far? Hey, hey Jennifer, can I can I ask a question, Brandon, before you answer that? But so one of the things that's, that I'm real curious about, and I think the customers might find benefit too, is you know, so are there certain materials, for example, that you would find are better suited for a mission critical environment piece of furniture that needs to last for eight or ten years? Or yes. does it doesn't really even matter. And, and you also mentioned your finishes. And so, you know, the work surface is where you do your work, right? So are there different types of processes to to finish, have that, that finish, if you will, on the work surface uh, to be more durable um, would be maybe the best way to describe that? Because, people, you know, these operators need this stuff to last for a long time. Absolutely. And, yes, materials do make a difference. Um, and with our console base, we like to use metal because it it does last. It uh, it is very robust. We're getting these larger screens, so we need to be able to lift this weight. It needs to be able to have that 24/7 durability. Um, in all mission critical type environments, these 24/7 environments for finishes specifically, we like to use polyurethane around the front edge. And we do ours a little different than, than everyone else. We actually build the mold box in-house and eject the polyurethane that attaches to the front work surface. So you would literally have to break the entire work surface before you would do anything to that edge. Um, so that edge you're talking about is what I would define as, in, in some parts of the industry, they call it bullnose edging maybe or comfort fit edging, is that the same thing that you're talking about, right on the front leading edge where your forearms rest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can call it uh, bull nose and soft edge, but it's just a polyurethane, um, the way we do it, and it conforms to that work surface. Yeah. And, you know, on, and on the work surfaces too, you know, making sure um, you have antibacteria type surfaces to, uh, you know, eliminate and minimize germs. One of the big things that we also manufacture and find um, mission critical environments love is the monitor arm mounting system. So one of the big things is now that everything's going from sit to stand, you wanna make sure not only can your monitor arm system be flexible and uh, reconfigure different ways, whether you're going two or three, 10 in a row, whatever it may be. But you also want to make sure when you're going from that sit to stand that there's not vibration in the monitors. So you're in the middle of an emergency situation, somebody's standing, your monitors start to vibrate as the um, console is, uh, is pushed up and down. So there are little things such as that that you really do need to pay attention to when you're um, looking into a console. But I would say the number one thing other than the materials and the durability um, is making sure that you choose a console, thinking as far as future proofing, that's flexible, that can change as the technology is changing as best as we can 
see it with our crystal balls, right? Um, but I would say that's the most important thing with the materials and the durability. I mean, your consoles, we have consoles and rooms that are 20 years old. So we are retrofitting some of those consoles. Some people didn't go sit stand back 20 years ago. So we're going in and making those sit stands. So our product is flexible to do that as we're changing with the times. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned sit stand several times. And I know that a lot of the customers that I work with, and, and I'm going to guess at the percentage here. I don't know this to be, you know, a fact exactly to the, to the exact percentage, but I would say 65, maybe as much as 70% of the customers I deal with today versus, uh, you know, four or five years ago would have been the other way around. Um, they, they want sit stand, right? They, they like the fact of the human factor issues, uh, being able to a worker stand up and stretch and, and stand for five minutes or 10 minutes and, you know, um, and then sit down and their work surface raises with them when they need to do that. Now I'll say, you know, I, I buy into that. I really do get that. Um, but I will say that there's a big mistake that a lot of, uh, a lot of folks make when they're designing their, their control room. Uh, if they have multiple rows of operators, whether you have two on the front row and two on the back row, or if you have 10 on the front row and 10 on the back row, is if you put sit stand consoles on the front row and you have a video wall, you absolutely have to factor in where's the top of the monitor going to be when that person's standing up. And unless you have really tall ceiling heights in that room where your video wall can be uh, mounted on the wall really high, then that front row of folks are going to be blocking a lot of the people from the back of the room. And I, I find that a lot of customers haven't thought that through, and why should they? They don't do it every day, right? But, uh, but I just thought I'd point that out. Yeah, and, and I actually, uh, we deal with that a lot on a regular basis. You know, hey, the, the front row's standing up, and now we can't, the second row can't see. I mean, there's multiple ways to do that with, um, take care of that with site line analysis, the way you configure your monitors. That then leads to the size of the console. Um, there's the stadium floor or raised floor, you know, the gradual raise that we sometimes see. If you have the real estate and you have the ceilings, if you're so fortunate to have all that, you can, of course, do that up front. Um, but with sit-stand, I'd probably say right now 90% um, of my clients are doing it. And they're also even doing this on the financial side. So this sit-stand is really um, picked up, I think, in the mission critical. It's a norm, um, for us at least. And I think the main... Uh, question out there from sit stand is whether it's a single plane or a dual plane, meaning do the monitors move independently of the work surface. So when you have that stand, that person standing, you can actually lower the monitors below that front work surface to get a better eye line and yeah. see those video walls. So, so this is a little bit of a loaded question. I just want to ask on behalf of the customers that are on, on the uh, call today, uh, okay. and, and just, I'm talking in generalities, right? So percentages. So if we, we take a console that's in this graphic here in the upper right hand corner, uh, it's not a sit stand solution versus the one in the lower left hand corner, like from a price point percentage wise, I mean, if you were to, to say one cost, you know, I'm just going to pull a number out of the air. One cost 5,000. How much more would a sit stand cost over and above a, a traditional fixed desk or work surface? Is it 20% more, 10% more? Um, so it really depends on the type of console. But if you're looking at your the top right and, and left right, because depending on how big the console is and how much weight we need to lift, depends on how many legs you need to push that weight. Gotcha. So if we're going to go, let's say, with these two-leg um, consoles, you're talking probably a thousand dollars more than the fixed it. Fixed mm height. -hmm. So, and so overall, uh, it is not that much more, and that includes yeah. the additional cable management because you do have to think about the cable management if you go sit stand. You need long yeah. cables. You need to make sure there's no points of failure. That it's easy for IT to get in and out if there is a problem. There is a little bit more to think about if you go sit stand, but I think it's worth it in the long run. 
Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, one other thing, and then we'll move on because we're going to run out of time. Like I said, I, we, we could talk about each of these best practices for 20, 30 minutes each. <laughs> but um, one of the things I also like to point out to customers is when you're working with a console provider uh, and looking at different solutions, when you select the work surface, uh, stay away from dark surfaces. Uh, and the reason I say that is that, you know, the studies and the science behind this from a human factor issue is that they, they show in, in a, a variety of different university studies that when you have a lot of contrast on your work surface with a darker work surface and white paper and et cetera, that contrast, believe it or not, over time when you're doing that day in, day out, um, really puts a lot of stress on the eyes. And, and that stress on the eyes can create headaches. And, and fatigue. And so if you look at most illustrations, 3D renderings, or console solution pictures, most of them have very light work surfaces where there's less contrast. And for example, you guys have a very light gray. And so it presents a lot less contrast between that paper that might be on the desk. And even though we're going away from paper um, in many ways, people still use it, right? And they will always use it. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out as, as something as, you know, people looking at different consoles and all. And uh, Robert, I want to interject here before we pull off a of console. I know I'm trying to keep to a timetable here, but um, for one of the things for people to notice if they do have access to the slides, if you can see what's going on here, um, I'm going to be referencing some of the consoles. Uh, I've worked for another console manufacturer. I've also sold an additional other console manufacturers equipment so I'm pretty well versed when it comes to these and there's one glaring thing that I've noticed in the industry that's really important for directors and people with projects to pay attention to uh, when it comes to the marketing everyone almost always says we do custom manufacturing which is nice and that they can customize a solution but then there's a downloadable PDF of a catalog of exactly all the parts and pieces. There's not really too much customization to it. It's already prefabricated. That kind of runs into a problem sometimes where it's not customizable. You pay for more than you're using. People hear the word customized and it automatically sets off bells that it's more expensive. But if you're really customizing, it can be less expensive. Take the console in the top right of the slide. Um, it has a two PC bay area. That's all it's fit for because some people don't need a lot of PC equipment. It takes up a lot of space. It adds a lot more expense if you have it. If you only have two, that's all you need to build to. Now take a look at the console on the bottom left of the slide. It is the exact same console, only split in the tabletop, but now that's a four PC bay console. With that sort of stuff, the, the difference that I found with SBFI is when we say custom, we actually mean it. There's no catalog. There's no purpose-built, already prefabbed pieces that we're always going to put together. We do an assessment of every control room and every individual operator's needs. So by how many monitors you need, how many PCs you need, you get exactly what you pay for as opposed to a prearranged system that is quote unquote customized and that's a really good difference when you're looking through marketing of some of the competing console manufacturers if you see we do custom work and then you immediately see a catalog after that it's something to be wary of and something that i've learned in the industry and something i'm proud that sdfi doesn't do yeah that's a good point that, that's that's interesting i'll say this when you're talking about this the the differences in those consoles with the PCs that are or what we would call local PCs at the console is that I'm just going to make a little prediction here. I don't have a crystal ball or I'm not reading the tea leaves, but I will make a, a, a general um, statement here that I think over the next maybe as early as two or three years, no, no more than four or five years in, in the control room environment, most um, most supervisors and directors and folks that are responsible for uh, for those rooms will be migrating local PCs and offloading that to virtualization. So they're, they're going to get rid of local PC and hardware at the console because all their software, everything's going to be virtualized and running on servers, these virtual servers. And so 
The design of a console is going to change dramatically over the next two to say four or five years because there's not going to be as much a need to have equipment at the console. And so, you know, I think, you know, it was stated earlier, Jennifer talked about, or maybe as you, Brandon, talked about future proofing. And so as you're designing these rooms and thinking about the consoles that you have, it's real important to ask yourself, uh, you know, a, uh, the question, in the future, are you going to be making changes in the, the way IT runs the business? And are they going to be virtualizing a lot of the, uh, the hardware that is used today, not just in the control room, but even at, at the, the workspaces uh, of the administration people, for example, or others that are on the staff that might not be sitting at that dispatcher's console? All that stuff is starting to trend towards being offloaded and, and all moved away out onto the network where it's all virtualized. So, um, you know, again, a lot of people wouldn't be thinking about that um, as they start planning this uh, for the future. But anyway, so like I said, we could talk about this for a long time, but let's, let's move on to um, something near and dear to my heart, and that is an area of, of our business uh, that is uh, where one of our skill sets um, is, and that is the common operating picture. And so the common operating picture for us, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a video wall. In most cases, it is. But it doesn't have to be. So just it's it's any type of display device that allows you to visualize your content, no matter if it's security cameras, traffic cameras, SCADA software, dispatch software, news or weather feeds. It doesn't matter. It could be all of those things combined, you know, uh, into a common operating picture that allows you to be able to connect the dots and for everybody in that room to be on the same page and can quickly and easily see the content on that screen and allow them to, first of all, have better situational awareness, and second of all, make better and more informed decisions um, and quickly, because it's right there in front of everybody. And a lot of times when, you know, the, the skies open up and, and, excuse the expression, but all hell breaks loose, you know, there's, you know, you get people coming into that room that aren't normally working in there, and you don't want those people hovering over the chairs and the backs of people sitting at their console looking at their desktop monitor, trying to make a real important decision that might affect the, the, the lives of people, you know, in the community or their, their employees or whatever it is. And, uh, and so the common operating picture in these video walls that are being used today and have been used for many, many years, just the technology has changed. Uh, this is a very, very important part of, uh, I think, driving the, the charter that a lot of these mission critical uh, rooms have and that is the ability to, um, to capture, if you will, that content and turn that content into actionable intelligence. And so that kind of being said, um, what's real interesting is the technology is changing so rapidly today. There was this period of time when I kind of first got into the mission critical part of the business where these video cubes, um, and some people may be familiar with that that are on the, the call today, but some may not. But video cubes were these big, you know, rear projection cubes that were made by manufacturers that, that came in different screen sizes, but they could be anywhere from three or four feet wide by two or three feet tall and two or three feet deep. And they stacked on top of each other and you build this big seamless video wall. And they were hugely expensive and uh, very complex technology. And that, that's starting to go away with the introduction of flat panel LCDs with the narrow bezels in them. And that, that technology has been out now for about seven or eight years. And, and I would say through the life cycle of a, of a product, it's uh, kind of reaching maturity right now. Although I think it has several years left before it's going to be totally phased out and, and other technology take over. But, uh, but the flat panel LCD, the narrow bezel is is kind of where most of the customers that we deal with today are in terms of their selection of a video wall. And the reason I say that is the new technology that's coming on, uh, I get a lot of questions from customers about it, and it's called a direct view LED. And it's a very different technology than LCD. And, and they, they utilize little small um, uh, uh, LED modules um, in those, uh, if you think, so the best way to describe it is you go to like a baseball game or a football game, you see the big, huge screens up in the stadium. Those are typically LED displays. 
and and from a distance of uh, 60, 70, 100, 200 feet, you know, the picture looks pretty good, right? But you get up close to it, it looks like that you have the photograph in a newspaper right up next to your face where you can see all the little dots that make up the photograph. And that's called pixel pitch. And so where I'm going with this is that, you know, I, I get a lot of customers asking about LED and I want LED in my new control room. You know, I hear it's the latest, greatest technology, but at the end of the day, if you look at the price point and the technology, it's just not ready yet, right? It's so much more expensive than LCD. And number two, the pixel pitch isn't there to give you the, the finer levels of definition you need in a control room to see, for example, a SCADA map, or if you're you know, looking at some type of detailed information, regardless of what it is, and until those pixel, that pixel pitch gets down um, a lot smaller, and that may be another year or two away, it's not far away, but until it does and that price is able to come down, LCD, narrow bezel LCD, is, uh, is going to be the dominant technology out there for establishing your common operating picture with a video wall. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that's really, for me, um, what's near and dear to my heart is, is again, because that's uh, the area that, that we specialize in is doing the technology and the video visualization for, for customers. But, um, you know, um, be careful with, you know, when you're out there looking at the different technologies to understand that. And there are a lot of white papers out there, too. And so the takeaway on this is, uh, you know, just do your homework and, you uh, a lot of different uh, websites and manufacturers you can look at their different products and you know um, just you know google a, a variety of different white papers and then you should get everything that you need to uh, have a, a greater understanding of this technology and so uh you know i, I know this all ties into sight lines and the consoles and and viewing distances etc and again, this is all an ecosystem with, you know, how does the display wall and the person sitting at the dispatch console work together? How far away from the screen should they be? You know, what what, what ceiling height do I have in there? Because, you know, here, here's the other thing I'll point out about video walls is that uh, much like with a console where you have, um, you're trying to establish where the sill height, which is the bottom of the video wall panel and the top of the desktop monitor so that you can see over the top of the desktop and and see the bottom of the video wall much like that's important for the operator it's also important to understand that you can only put the video wall size that you put in your room is dictated basically by the ceiling height in many ways Be, because if you have a nine foot ceiling you know and you need a 52 inch sill height at the bottom of that video wall you only have so much space to work with, right? So you're not going to get a video wall like you see in this picture, three tall by three or four or six wide. You won't get that in a nine foot ceiling. You just don't have the physical room without maybe having the bottom of those screens down about two feet off the floor. And that's just not you know, doable for mission critical operations. So always kind of look at uh, when you're designing these rooms, trying to think them through that, hey, yeah, I've got 10 or 12 foot ceilings. You have a lot more runway, if you will, to work with uh, for the size of the video wall that you want to put in there. Uh, so let's move on real quick because we're, we're you know, I'm starting to get a little long-winded here and run out of time. We're, we're hugging up next to 50 minutes here. Um, you know, one of the areas that uh, that we work with too uh, that that's, I'm finding a lot of customers are becoming more and more interested in is, you know, how do I? So so look, let's back up a bit. So control rooms and mission critical environments are very important to the operational success of a company or an agency or uh, to drive safety in the community. There's no doubt about it. You know, having a video wall for the common operating picture, the right consoles, have all this work together, that, that's all great stuff, right? But our customers are starting to say, that, that's fine, Robert, but look, let's take it to the next level. What do you have? What can you do to help me become more productive in my workspace. And when I ask them, well, what is productivity do you mean? They start today, they're, they're talking about how do I take all this data and the information that I have that I'm monitoring, whether it's in SCADA, is it a, a you know, um, records management, if it's a, a real-time crime center, it, you know, license plate tag readers, is it, you know, video, whatever it is, how do I take all this vast amount of data, some people call it big data, how do I do analytics and correlation on that 
so that I can pull that information into a dashboard, if you will, that allows me to turn all that information and its thousands of pieces of information into very actionable intelligence. And that's where software comes in. And there are, there are um, database management softwares that go beyond just basic database management and correlating some very simplistic things about one data set versus another. There, there, there are some, some companies out there that are doing some pretty special things with uh, what I would call a correlation and involving machine learning and learning you know, trends and patterns, looking for these trends and patterns in data or anomalies in things that are happening that can automatically bring that anomaly or that trend in that pattern to the forefront of the awareness of that operator sitting there and be more predictive, if you will, in their approach to you know, solving a problem. So rather than waiting for something to happen, they can now, through very advanced software, tying in all these different layers of databases into a very automated, if you will, tool, that they're now able to, I wouldn't call it predict, but they're able to be more preemptive, if you will, in the way that they, they manage potential problems. So they got, have a little bit more of a, a heads up that things are about to happen because an alarm went off that was, was triggered by, sorry about that, that was triggered by um, an automated process set up by the software. So, you know, when we talk about best practices in the control room environment, we're not just talking about the way the room is laid out and designed. That's important. The video wall is important. The console, how, how this stuff works together. But it's becoming as much of a tool and as important uh, to have the right type of automation, if you will, in the processes to make the operator's job as easy as possible through the software integration piece. And uh, so, you know, this part of best practices software uh, is extremely important today, and it's just going to keep getting more important and growing as, uh, as data and, and knowledge is more accessible uh, to, these, uh, to the customers that need uh, mission-critical environments. Uh, so coming up on, on really the last part of our our webinar today is, is lighting, and, and I'm going to ask Jennifer and, and Brandon to chime in here too, is that, you know, I know in my experience when I work in these rooms to help design a, a control room, uh, another thing that's often overlooked is lighting. It's not today as important as it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago when the brightness and the contrast levels and the, 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 the color um, saturation, if you will, and and of these uh, display devices, whether it's projector, LCD, display wall. Uh, the, back in the day, uh, you know, lighting was really, really important because th these systems weren't designed for high light environments. Well, today there are so many different adjustments that are automatically made to flat panel LCDs in a video wall where it's automatically adjusting the brightness and contrast all of the time, um, and it adjusts it to the room environment uh, lighting is a little bit less important than it used to be in terms of being sensitive to it because we can operate in higher light environments. But there are a few things that are real important when you're laying out a room is to know how a room's lighting is zoned so that you can have ultimate control of, of you know, which set of lights in which zone are turned on or off or dimmable or not dimmable. And especially in the bigger rooms, there could be work groups in certain areas of the room that they don't want their lights to be turned up very bright. It's not how they work. It's not the best way to work, but yet you have another group over here that prefers to have their lighting up a little brighter. So the fact of having some control over the lighting in these uh, mission critical rooms is very important. And so, you know, kind of with that, you know, Jennifer and Brandon, it, it, you know, when you work with your customers laying out rooms and all, I, I would imagine lighting comes up pretty, pretty frequently, right? Definitely, and this is Brandon. Um, when it gets into lighting, and uh, I know we'll dive a lot deeper into this in the, the further webinar when we go across with uh, active display systems and video, um, the, the biggest point that I'll hit home, especially, you know, considering our time right now, is that it's just another example of how important the operator focus is in the beginning of the control room process 
a single change like a console or lighting or uh, even a software system in an office can happen and it's perfectly fine. In a mission critical control room, it never happens in a vacuum. Everything interacts with everything else when you have operators that sit for a 12 hour shift. Um, lighting affects how they're going to work on their console, what type of materials they can use, how they interact with the video wall. If they have light coming in from a window, is that flushing things out? Um, getting to my point is that this is a small thing that compared to the rest of the pieces in the control room isn't the most important. It does get talked about, but it's something that always has to happen in that conversation in the beginning. If you're not operator focused on every single piece at the beginning, if you get too wowed with the features of how many monitors and how many desks and the latest software, you can overlook small important things that are essential to operators enjoying their job, like what type of lighting is in there and how strained are their eyes going to be after a 12 hour shift. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, the other thing that I've noticed too is I, I get a lot of customers um, give me this feedback is it's something again that you just don't think about. It's very small. It's one of the nuances is task lighting at the work surface. So you, you might have a, you know, reflective ceiling plan and lighting schematic that, you know, that's really well thought through and, and, and well laid out and executed. But I have a lot of my customers say that that's all great, but you know what? I love my task light. And uh, so for those of you that might not be familiar with the task light, a lot of times it's sort of like a gooseneck light. That's a very small light that might come up from the corner of the console and and be able to be adjusted and moved over the top of the monitor so it shines right down on your keyboard. It's not overly bright. It just provides just enough direct light in that little area. And I have so many customers that, to me, you know, they go like, well, you know, that, that makes it for me. That, that's what gets me excited, <laughs> you know, that little task light. It gives me that little extra light that I need. So uh, it's not just about, you know, reflective ceiling plans and, and lighting like that. But... Uh, Anyway, so we're, we're kind of coming up on, on an hour now, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, you know, as we kind of close out here, I, I just want to thank everybody for, for being a part of, of the webinar today. And to your point, Brandon, we have two others that are coming up, uh, one next month and one in August. One's going to be strictly focused on the console furniture aspect in a mission-critical environment, and we're going to be doing – a very deep dive in, into that area. And then in um, August, late August, we'll do the same type of deep dive, but on the video wall visualization side of technology. And none of these are meant to be necessarily overly promoted as product sales pitches. What we want to do is try to be educational. You know, occasionally we are going to bring up manufacturers' names or product names and, and things like that. The, the whole intent is not necessary for this to be an infomercial for us as much as it is. We want to be educational. We want to provide you with value, uh, good tips and techniques of things you might not have thought about. And at the end of the day, you know, you kind of walk away from, from the time we've spent together going like, I, I learned something. I'm glad I heard that because, you know, I had no idea, you know, and, and this is going to help me on my, my project. So, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, um, you know, if you guys want to be included on the next two webinars, feel free to, uh, reach out to us. I'm going to give you an email address in a second. We'll make sure you're included on that. But as we kind of wrap up, you know, in the best practices part, I would say the takeaways are to think of, you know, the control room, no matter how small it is, how big it is, is to think of it as an ecosystem where everything really, if it's thought through up front well, it, it, it'll work much better for you than to try to do one piece of it separate from another piece, separate from another, or not even considering how other pieces of this room work together to make it a really special environment for people to work in. And it doesn't cost a lot to do that. It doesn't add a lot to the project from a financial perspective to do that. It's really more about a little bit of time and asking the right questions and having people uh, on your team that know the right questions to ask. Because there is, there's a lot of science behind this. There's a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't understand, and it's those little nuances. They say that the devil's in the details, so it's very true in the space that, that we work within. So um, kind of that being said, there, these are the two dates of the upcoming webinars in July. It'll be on the 24th, 2 o'clock, and then also it'll be um, in August uh, on the 26th at 2 o'clock. So put those on your calendar if it's of interest to you. 
and then the two ways that you can reach out to us to say you'd like to be invited uh, to those would be either reach out to me, Robert Cameron, which is rcameron at diversifiedus.com, or you can reach out to Jennifer at her address at jennifer.taylor at sbfi.com. And so kind of with that, before we wrap up, I want to provide an opportunity for anybody that may have had a few questions. Uh, let's not, you know, close out without that. So Lisa, have, have you had any questions that may have come in that, that we need to address real quick? Yeah, actually a, a few have come in. Uh, this one's interesting. Are there solutions that incorporate the displays or video wall into the console furniture? So that's both uh, maybe for us and for Jennifer and Brandon. So I want to do this. If you'll um, excuse me for a second, I'm going to go back several slides because I think the answer to that is in a picture right here. So yes is the answer from my perspective is that we are seeing uh, quite a few customers that um, maybe they don't have the room, maybe they don't have the budget for a video wall, but they do need some larger displays to create that common operating picture. And we're seeing more and more customers wanting to incorporate, you know, larger monitors or video walls with the console. So it's not a video wall that's mounted on the wall. It's actually built into the design of the console. And I bring this picture up uh, right here. It's a side view of something very similar to maybe what this uh, attendee is asking. And that is where you have your console furniture and then you would actually have a monitor structure with your desktop monitors below and one to two, or depending on what it is you want to display, 4K monitors, and then they go fairly large today. They get on up into the 90-something inch diagonals in size, so that's a large 4K monitor. And so you have to be careful with, you know, how to not get too big. But yeah, the answer is absolutely. We, we, we see that happening pretty frequently. Um, Jennifer, you, you guys want to add to that? I think she may be on mute. Hey there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, you hit, you hit it just right. Um, yes, there are solutions for that, and um, we have built them that um, are sort of like that picture that you're you're showing. But we have different vari variations that can be done to integrate it with the console. Yeah, and I think I think the the real answer is you know is again depending on what it is you're working with, how you work. Um, what size room do you have, and, and a whole other list of factors. But yeah, um, um, that would be the answer. All right, and uh, kind of following up on the, on the control room furniture, it says, uh, what trends do you see happening with control room furniture? And uh, also, there's a question that uh, addresses the lifespan of a control room console. Oh, Jennifer, I'll let you guys take that one. Yes. Um, as far as the trends that we are seeing, in fact, I think, Robert, you mentioned this um, earlier, we are seeing the screens, the monitors getting larger. So they're getting bigger, bigger and bigger, but the PCs are getting smaller. So the design of how we house the, the PCs looks a little different, um, such as the uh, what Brandon was saying with the picture of the consoles, one housing, you know, small thin client form factors and the other one housing PCs. So that's the trends that I see now. It's just the, the, the equipment and, and how it's evolving the shape and the design of the console. And the other question was lifespan. I mean, lifespan usually say budget every 10 years for upgrades of control rooms, but the uh, console should be 15 to 20 years. It should be durable enough to handle that. The technology would be changing um, faster and it comes into that future proofing we were talking about, then you have a problem with the durability. Great. Uh, and uh, here's a question probably for Robert. Uh, what software do you recommend to automate the dispatcher or operator processes, such as daily tasks, alerts, alarms, so forth? Um, okay, so, you know, I would say the answer to that is very broad <laughs> because it would depend on really what it is that the customer is trying to accomplish, right? And so, 
if I threw out a couple of names of some software, um, it might not be the right software for that particular application. But, um, you know, so for example, in the utility industry the, with SCADA or dispatch and, you know, other things that they're monitoring might be different than somebody in the 911 that's utilizing, you know, um, CAD and, and, you know, records management and stuff like that. But I think, you know, that being said, they're, they're, I'll just drop the name of one particular company right now. And I only drop this particular name is I've worked with them on some projects before, and, and they've had a pretty interesting approach to what they do where they can work, you know, across different vertical markets and, and requirements. It's called Sitscape, S-I-T-S-C-A-P-E. And so they're, they're really what I would define as a data analytics and correlation engine. And so they can do what we talked about earlier, and that is where, you know, you take this data that's in the background and then do quick analysis and correlation on it and then pull that into a dashboard that makes it really easy for people to see the operational overview of a few things rather than, lots and lots of things that you can't really make heads or tails of. So, you know, I hope that answers the question is, you know, again, it it's, depends on what the nature is of what somebody wants to do. Right. And, you know, I recall that um, you actually did a, a really great webinar with uh, Kevin from uh, the CEO of Sitscape some months back. So I, I would think if, if anybody wanted some additional information on that, they could reach out to you and we could get them the link to that recorded webinar. If that's of interest. Uh, I, yeah, that's right. We did. We did. This was back last October, I think we did it, and it was on cybersecurity. Is that the one? There you go. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. Yeah. It was a, that was a good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that one sticks yeah. in my head. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions here that just they just keep coming in. I'm sorry. Um, how long will a video wall last before it has to be replaced? Uh, well, if we're talking about um, the LCD technology today that's being used and will be used until the LED becomes mature enough to be able to replace it, LCD, um, as a rule, has a, about a five-year life to it. And, you know, that's generally speaking. You might get four or six. But about five years, you're, you're going to be looking at replacing those. But, but it's okay, right? So compared to what was around with video cubes prior to that, where those video cubes could range from 12 or 15,000 on the low end to 25 or 30 on the high end, to, to spend $3,500 or four grand on a, on a display monitor, a flat panel monitor is nothing compared to what it used to be. So, you know, when you compare them, it's actually good news. <laughs> But now, l l let me say this, um, as LED, one of the strengths of LED is it has a lot longer life on it, and, and you can get anywhere from eight to 10 years on an LED solution. But, but like I said, that's not really, I don't think, ready for the mission critical environment for most of them. There, there may be a few where they just want an operational overview up on a wall in a big room, and nobody's really looking at it to do any type of work from it. It's just an operational overview, and, you know, they're 30, 40 feet away from the image. Yeah, well, maybe in that kind of environment, if you have the budget, a LED wall would work out fine. But I think that's not the norm. Gotcha. And uh, just one last question that, that's come in, um, just probably a, a great recap question. Uh, when choosing a console, what are the most important factors to consider? This is this Jennifer. Um, when just speaking um, directly to the console, of course, we've talked about the room and, and how they all interplay with each other. I would say um, flexibility, um, future proofing, thinking, and simplicity, and materials. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in with understanding exactly what your operator needs, not putting too many distracting things on a desk, too many features, really getting to the heart of how they work and then designing a system from the ground up like that. That's great. Okay, well, that, that, uh, that addresses all the questions that we've gotten in so far. Oh, okay, good. Those are good, good questions. And uh, so, you know, 
I'd like to just thank everybody again for joining us today. And, you know, you have a way to reach out to us if you want to join us on future webinars. If you have any questions about uh, if you have a project that you're, you know, about to work on or you're already working on it, you, you have some questions, you know, I'm always available. I know Jennifer and team uh, are to just answer questions for you. We're here to help you. Uh, we certainly like to earn your business if you have a project, but you know more than that. Let, let us help you and educate you so you do the right thing, and um, and your project's a success. And so you know how to reach us. Please feel free to do so. And I really hope you join us on these upcoming webinars uh, next month and in August. And with that, thank you, Jennifer and Brandon and Lisa for in, being in the background. And uh, we hope to talk to you soon. No problem. Have a good day. Thank you.